Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canale, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Joining us today is a gentleman who has been running and writing for more than 50 years, a writer at large with Runner's World Magazine and Runner'sWorld.com. He's the winner of the 1968 Boston Marathon, a running journalist, author, and was the editor-in-chief at Runner's World and also served as editor-at-large. He's a speaker, coach, and has written over 1,000 articles that have been published in Podium Runner, The Washington Post, Runner's World, just to name a few. He was a focused competitor and is in the Hall of Fame for Road Runners Club of America and the National Distance Running Hall of Fame. He's also in the Hall of Champions with Running USA and received the Journalistic Excellence Award two times by Road Runners Club of America. Please welcome to the show, Ambie Burfoot. Ambie, welcome to Before the Lights. Tommy, thank you very much, and especially for that um, lengthy introduction. You are welcome. Before we get going, I want to make my listeners aware of a brand new product called Only Three Snack Crisps. It's one of the most delicious, healthy chips available to snackers today. Spelt flour, sea salt, and spring water is all you'll find in this delicious 130-calorie treat. They are perfect with your favorite dip, on the go, in between meals, and as a bonus, they're vegan friendly too. Order your three pack bundle today at onlythreesnacks.com. Onlythreesnacks.com. Listeners, I got to tell you, I've tried them and they are absolutely delicious. So get your hands on these new snacks. Ambie, what has running taught you? <laughs> um, r- running has taught me a few very basic, simple lessons. I'm not the kind who goes on endlessly about runner's high and all sorts of metaphysical BS like that. (laughs) Uh, But, Tommy, I think running teaches everyone who sticks with it for a little while that sticking with it is the name of the game. And uh, you don't have to have a lot of talent to be relatively successful at running. You just have to get out there and ply your trade, your, your craft, uh, the workouts, three, four, five, six, as many times a week as you would like to. So it's like so many other things, uh, the discipline, the determination, the consistency really pay dividends one way in which it's easier to measure the dividends than a lot of other areas of life is that we tend to use a stopwatch in running. And so you've got a clock going. And uh, as long as you can see the clock running in the right direction for you, it's very motivating and you can measure your progress. What are the number of miles that you have ran lifetime for our listeners? Uh, I'm around 110,000 miles lifetime. I will be 75 years old in a month. I'm happy to report that I'm absolutely orthopedically 100 uh, percent. Nothing in my body hurts. And I could go out and run a marathon today if I needed to, which fortunately <laughs> I don't. Uh, I'm Unhappy to report that I'm getting slower by the day. However, that does seem to be what happens with age. And uh, I hope someday I will learn to accept that. But for now, I'm still fighting. I don't know if us as runners ever accept the fact that we're getting slower. We always believe we still have it in us. I'm still trying new workouts. Uh, this couple of weeks ago, I started doing hill sprints again because I hadn't done them for a while. Um, realistically, I know I'm not going to get faster, but I would like to stem the uh, outgoing tide as much as I can at this point. Ambie, how do you, did you combine your passion with your profession? Well, I have to start even before that. I can't talk to anyone about anything in my life without acknowledging the incredible good fortune that I had in high school, where I happened to go to a school, a high school in Groton, Connecticut, Robert Fitch High School, where the cross-country coach was America's best runner for a decade. He won the Boston Marathon. He made two Olympic teams. His name was John J. Kelly which is, in fact, different from John A. Kelly, who was known as old John Kelly. This My guy was young John Kelly because he was a little bit younger. 
but he was absolutely pivotal and influential in in my life. I don't want to call him a Renaissance man, but he was so far ahead of his time, it's almost impossible to imagine. In the 1950s, he was an organic gardener, and nobody knew what organic gardening was in the 1950s. He was an environmentalist. He rode his bicycle to work instead of driving a polluting vehicle. Uh, He was anti-big bureaucracy, anti-war, anti-all the stuff that most of us are anti, and he was pro workers and labor and collectivism and and all the good things. So he just happened into my life at the perfect time for me. I sort of latched on to him in a a quiet, listening way. And even though he did not teach scriptural lessons, he wasn't a, these are the 10 rules of life. These are the commandments you must follow guy. He was the opposite of that. Um, But what I followed was not... Scripture, I followed his life as I viewed it and as I it, it unfolded in front of my eyes. And, and that has been a good beacon my entire life. When did you, did you start running? At what age? And did, was John J. Kelly the one that got you going? Yeah. So my story's quite simple. My father was a YMCA director type. He was, you know, uh, trained to be a a sports coach. And so I grew up playing all the sports when I was young. I had an obsessive personality, it seems. So I practiced and practiced and practiced. And on a basketball court alone, I could outshoot anyone. On a baseball field, there were a lot of things that I could do as well as anyone. Uh, But on a basketball court where people were vigorously defending me, (laughs) making things unpleasant, I didn't have the speed, power, muscle, jump, height that you need to be successful in basketball. Baseball was an easy sport by um, comparison. And I like to tell people, last year I ever played organized baseball, I won the uh, batting championship in my league. I batted, I don't know, 461 or one of those stupid numbers. (laughs) But then um, I discovered running uh, through this association with John Kelly. Uh, I decided to try it one day. Actually, there was a basketball genesis. Uh, My high school basketball team was not good, and I was the least good of the members of the team. I was rarely put into a game until we were about 59 points behind, (laughs) and it was too late. Um, One day, we were having a typically bad practice, and the coach got really ticked off at us, and he said, you guys suck. Get off of my basketball court and go run the cross-country course for punishment. So we had to go trudge around the cross-country course, and I was with a bunch of guys who were all better basketball players than me, but I finished the cross-country course before they did. And at that point, I just sort of said to myself, okay, Ambie, you want to stick with this one sport that you suck at, or you want to try something else and see if you're any good at it? And I decided to try that other thing, the cross country. And that's where John Kelly, just by chance, uh, entered my life because he was our cross country coach. From there, how did you end up choosing to attend Wesleyan University? Wesleyan kind of chose me. I was not sophisticated about a university choice. I didn't have a lot of guidance I remember uh, we didn't have a web back then, of course. We had a big, thick college handbook, and I read it backwards, literally from the back to the front, because the last part of each college description was uh, scholarship aid, and I knew I needed scholarship aid. And um, so I'm going through the book backwards, and there's Wesleyan. It's already at the back of the book, and I hit the scholarship aid, aid. Before I turn the page to see what college it is, and here's this description of a college which tries really hard to give scholarship to needy kids, and that was me. I turned the page. It was Wesleyan. Uh, I applied. I got in on early admissions in December, saving myself the pressure of waiting till April like everybody else, so I just I just went for it. I was extraordinarily lucky. It was not a running choice at all, and I'll tell you a funny story about my college coach in a minute if we get to that. But um, it turned out to be a very, very 
good choice for me because Wesleyan was a school that prizes individuality and it encouraged everyone to go for it in whatever their particular passion was, if it was physics or theater or art or cross country. And I was in that last group and that's what I went for. You were roommates with Bill Rogers. He ended up winning the Boston Marathon later four times. What was your influence on him and how did maybe Bill push you to become a better runner? Uh, before we get to Bill, when I arrived at Wesleyan, an upper class, there was an upperclassman there named Jeff Galloway, who has been just as influential in the sport of running as Bill and myself through the years. And uh, Jeff was an inspiration to me because he was so hardworking. He was so strong. For the first couple of years, I just tagged along behind Jeff day after day after day and got a little bit stronger each day. And then he graduated and I had to go on on my own. Uh, I was Wesleyan is in Connecticut. Bill Rogers was running high school cross country in Connecticut. My brother was also running high school cross country in Connecticut. So I would go to these state championship meets and root for my brother to beat Bill Rogers in cross country, which my brother actually did once. He likes to uh, crow. (laughs) But uh, I I did have a few conversations with Bill. I don't think I was a heavy influence. And I said he should give Wesleyan a look. And he probably looked and saw me and saw Jeff and decided it was a good place for runners. Uh, So he came there. He followed along uh, after us. He was not in college, the Bill Rogers that he became afterwards. Uh, It took him a few more years to, let's say, mature to the point (laughs) that Jeff and I were already at in college where we were we were focused and we were going for it. Bill in college was a great runner, but he was interested in having good times. And so he wasn't getting up at six o'clock in the morning for the early runs with me and Jeff. <laughs> What's the uh, good story of your college coach? Yeah, so my college coach was, uh, his name was Jay Elmer Swanson. And uh, he had been an assistant out at the University of Michigan before coming to Wesleyan. And he nearly made it to the big leagues in the Detroit Tiger system as a first baseman. He was a tall stout fellow, great hitter. Uh, His track background was as a indoor high hurdler. He never actually ran outdoor track because that was baseball season. So my story is that my college coach never ran more than 55 meters in his life because (laughs) that was his indoor track distance in hurdles. Uh, And when I arrived at Wesleyan, he was still uh, chewing tobacco. And he had an honest to God spittoon in the corner of his track office and could do the tobacco spitting thing uh, into his spittoon. He gave it up a few years later. He was a great guy. We got along famously. Wesleyan was a very was not an athletic school and he was not there to produce great athletes just to be encouraging and helpful. And it didn't take him long to recognize that people like me and Jeff were going to do far, far more training than he would have asked us to do. So he, he was smart enough to get out of our way, let us go, and then rein us in when we got too enthusiastic. Amy, before we get into the 68 Boston Marathon, my understanding is the first time you ran Boston was in 1965. What about the first time you ran the course did you take with you to give you some inspiration to try and win the race a few years later? My first time was 65. I was a freshman at Wesleyan. I didn't tell the coach that I was going to skip practice and go run a marathon that day. Um, at all I, What I remember primarily about my first Boston was in the old days, They had weird mileage markers on the course, and they did them in reverse. In other words, instead of saying 5K, 10K, 15K, the mileage markers said 19 and three-sevenths miles to go, and then 12 and a quarter miles to go, and then 10 and eight miles to go, and you had to do a lot of math in your head. 
anyway, I hit the one that said 19 and something miles to go. And I thought to myself, oh, Christ, I've never run that far in my life. I'm running in trouble <laughs> today. And the other thing was in your first Boston, you've heard so much about Heartbreak Hill that you assume it's at least twice as tall and steep and treacherous as Mount Everest. So I went through the hills constantly asking bystanders, where's heartbreak? Where's heartbreak? Where's heartbreak? Nobody seemed to answer me. And finally, I got a response and they said, oh, you just went over it. It's behind you. And it was like nothing my first year because I was so fearful of it. Uh, I hastened to add it got higher, taller and steeper in every subsequent year that I ran Boston. In 1968, what about that day made you feel like I've seen some interviews with you where you felt like you had a pretty good chance to win that race. What made you feel that way? In 1968, for the only time in my life, and and there's no explanation for it, I can only present it as fact. uh, I was in an absolute state of flow as I got towards the Boston Marathon. I recognized it maybe 10 days out when I was doing my regular warm-ups at Wesleyan. I would just jog around the, the track, warming up as slow as I could go, and I would look at my watch, and the time on my watch indicated that I was running much faster than the effort I was putting into it. This is just a warm-up effort, and I was going at a pretty good pace. And I had never experienced that before. I can't say that I ever really experienced it to the same magnitude since. But fortunately, uh, that feeling, that flow extended to race day at Boston. And I got into the middle of the race and I was running with uh, the lead group. And there were 10 or 12 of us through 10 miles and then to Wellesley. And I absolutely felt like I was jogging. And here I was with the leaders of the Boston Marathon, and it felt like I was jogging. And when I finally decided at halfway to do a little surge, just just a tiny little nothing, I expected it would have no effect whatsoever on the runners around me. Instead, all of them, 10 of them dropped back, and only one of them stayed with me. And that meant that the two of us would have a mano a mano duel for the last 13 miles which was terrifying it was absolutely the most frightening athletic experience of my life because you know somebody's going to win and somebody's going to finish second and while there's no shame in finishing second in the boston marathon it's not quite as good as first and that's what we both wanted and i just happened to be the lucky one that day what was your feelings when you win the Boston Marathon, and what do you remember after you crossed the finish line? Do you have anything left? I had absolutely nothing left. I I very clearly remember collapsing like a wet noodle into the arms of the infamous uh, Jock Semple, uh, the race manager who the year before had famously pushed Catherine Switzer off the course. Mm. Um, He was, in fact, a friend and a great supporter of all runners, but... uh, he had that one incident with Catherine. He, he collapsed. He grabbed me as I collapsed, held me up. Uh, the mayor or governor put a, a wreath on my head. I remember virtually nothing except for the overwhelming feeling that I wanted to be reunited with my coach, John Kelly, who was, in fact, still running the Boston Marathon that day. And he was 10 minutes behind me, perhaps, that day. And nothing else mattered except that I would have the opportunity to tell him that I had won, uh, that I owed it all to him, uh, that I didn't have words to express everything he had given me through the years. Uh, But for the two of us to share that moment together uh, was a, a deep, visceral, emotional, cranial thrill uh, that didn't need words. It just needed the opportunity for us to hug each other. Amby, what were the shoes like in 1968 (laughs) compared to what we have these days? (laughs) The year before I won Boston, uh, this is a long answer uh, to the shoe question. uh, There was a Nike representative on the East Coast 
And he asked me if I wanted to sell some shoes for him. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll sell some shoes for you. And the shoes sold for $9 and I got a $1 commission on each <laughs> shoe sale. And a year or so later, I don't remember if it was before or after, uh, his business was going pretty well selling Nike shoes on the East Coast. And he said to me, I swear to God, how would you like to become the East Coast sales manager for Nike shoes on the East Coast? And I said to him, yeah, let me think about that for a couple of days. And then I called him back and said, you know, Jeff, uh, sales is not my thing. I'm a runner. I don't want to sell shoes. You know, if I can help you, that's great. But I don't want to be your shoe salesman. So uh, I, that was when I lost my several billion dollars of <laughs> uh, shoe sales income. But the uh, the shoes were were nine dollars and ninety five cents. They were actually a precursor to to Nike. It was called Tiger then. It became Nike in a year or two, and they were literally nothing but a light upper and a very thin outsole on the bottom. There was no such thing as a midsole. All this thick cushioning that we have in our shoes now just didn't exist. So uh, we hit the road and we hit the road hard when we ran in them, but it was all we knew. Uh, for some reason, nobody ever got injured. We never talked about injuries back then. I don't know how that could have been. Uh, we all adapted to the shoes, I guess, because Pretty much everyone running then was a sub three hour marathoner and pretty lean and tough and mean. And we just uh, gutted it out however we had to. 68 was a good year for you because also in December of that year, you ran a PR of 214 28 and it was one second from the American world record at the time at the marathon in Japan. Did you feel just as good then as you did at the Boston? I certainly did not feel as confident in Japan as I did at Boston because uh, literally it, it, the world's best runners was there were there. It was not the Olympics, but the Fukuoka Marathon in Japan then and ever since, uh, many times won by Frank Shorter, Bill Rogers, and other great runners, was known as the unofficial world championships of marathoning. So I'm a 22-year-old kid. I've probably never been on an international plane flight. And they, you know, somebody sends me to Japan and I get off the plane. And of course, the Japanese treat us fantastically. And every day they take us to this park to do a little bit of training as we're tapering for the race. And I see these other guys who are all super fast marathon runners and every day on their taper, they took off and disappeared. It was like they were running five minute pace on their taper days. And my taper was just jogging three or four miles. And so I was like, oh, my God, this is not so good. Uh, and that kind of rattled my confidence a little. But on race day, I felt good. The weather conditions were great. The course was great. And it was a simple matter of. Here are here's a race with ten people who are capable of run, running five minute pace and in, in for a long long way, including me. So I ran five minute pace as long as I could run on that day, and for me it turned out to be to the twenty five kilometer point. And at that point, the eventual winner actually picked the pace up and started running faster. And that was like, goodbye, dude. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, just hold on and run for every place and minute and second I possibly could. I had no idea what the American marathon record was. And I'm sure if someone had told me to sprint harder for the record at the end, I could have eked out one second. Uh, nonetheless, to, to run 214.29 uh, at Fukuoka was one of the great thrills and accomplishments of, of my career. And uh, like the Boston win, it was something uh, I wish I could have done it again. I certainly tried. I certainly thought that I got back in a similar kind of condition, but I was never able to pull the magic strings again. So 68 was indeed the my magical year with my two big races. And I often tell people that what I'm not proudest of is uh, what I'm proudest of is not winning and running fast in 1968, but the fact that I'm still running and running slow 
uh, 50 some years later, because I've been getting slower for the last, I guess it's uh, 53 years of my life. Uh, every day I'm slower, but I'm still out there. I'm still looking for challenge. I'm still mixing up, mixing it up with friends, uh, most of whom these days are much faster than I am. But it's uh, it's great to be active. It's great to be running. It's great to be part of the running community. On that note, before I go into you joining Runner's World magazine, do you think it's ever too late for somebody to pick up running regardless of age? No, I think it is never too late. A great friend of mine, a Stanford geriatrician, Walter Bortz, has said, it's never too late to start and it's always too soon to stop. Mm. So it's not too late to start. Obviously, when you start late, you're not going to beat a lot of people. You're not going to set a lot of records. You can still set personal records, and you can certainly improve personally through uh, seven or eight or ten years uh, of your running career. But the reasons we do it in late life is because we realize that life is fleeting. We realize that aging is a tough business. We realize that we have choices to make, which are either to sit in the rocking chair and just watch aging overtake us, or to get out of the rocking chair and get out there on the roads or bike or skis or whatever, swimming pool, and and keep active and stay as fit as we can, even if we're, we're slow. Fortunately, there are a lot of people doing it now, so even if those who are 60 and 70 and 80 Uh, We'll find company out there and we'll find others with the same spirit and energy and determination that they have. I love that. In 78, you joined Runner's World magazine. How did you get that job and what was your first position there? In 1978, that was a year after Jim Fix's famous book, The Complete Book of Running, uh, Mm -hmm. was published. And it had a huge worldwide impact. Out in Runner's World, which was uh, on the West Coast uh, near Palo Alto, the circulation chart on the wall was going straight up. And they were doing a lot of stories by West Coast authors about West Coast culture and didn't have a voice on the East Coast. And so they reached out to me. They asked Hal Higdon if he knew anyone on the East Coast. Hal was in the Midwest in Chicago. They asked Hal if he knew anyone on the East Coast who might be a possible contributor, and Hal knew me through running and a very, very minimal amount of writing that I had done at that point. And he suggested that Runner's World contact me. Uh, They did. I practically dropped dead on the spot because I couldn't imagine a, a, a more ideal job than working for Runner's World magazine. And... They even threatened to pay me for it. So that was (laughs) another step up. And uh, so I had discussions at the Boston Marathon that spring with the editor publisher of Runner's World. And he more or less hired me on the spot as his East Coast editor. And uh, I held that position for the next, I guess, six years until the magazine moved east. And um, I would fly out to California for a couple of times a year for editorial meetings. Otherwise, we did everything by phone, of course. And uh, whenever there was a big story in Europe, (laughs) where the good runners were, I was closer to Europe than they were. So I got to do a lot of the good stories in Europe. So I had some uh, real exciting assignments in those days. Could you chat about in 84 when you witnessed Joan Benoit Samuelson come into the Olympic Stadium to win gold? Yeah, that was um, probably the most incredible spectator and emotional runner uh, time of my life, uh, viewing someone else. Uh, I will add that I had been visiting Joni. I had written about Joni about six months before that, visiting her in Maine in the, in the winter, in like January. And all of her competitors, uh, Greta Weitz and Rosa Moda and everybody else around the world had flown to uh new zealand or australia or arizona or some warm place to train for the olympics and joni's in portland maine 
She's living in this shell of a house, which she has just bought. Um, before we go out and run in the morning, she goes to the bathroom and I'm standing at just outside the bathroom, which only has two walls to it. <laughs> it was practically embarrassing, but that, that was just who she was and the kind of life that she'd led. She was so comfortable in Maine and she could go out almost every day and run a killer 20 miler. Um, I was still fit then and ran a couple with her and it was astonishing how fit she was that winter. Then she got injured in the spring just before the Olympic marathon trials, had to have the famous knee surgery and still came back to qualify for the trials and then to win in the Olympics itself in Los Angeles. And I'm 99% sure that she was not as fit in Los Angeles as she had been that winter in Maine before the injury, but Mm. she was fit enough to go for it and Go for it, she did. And I was wearing a press pass in the stadium, watching on the big monitor and on TV like everybody else. And she takes off at 5K and just drops the entire field. And I'm screaming at her through the through the monitor, Joni, you idiot, that's not the way you run the marathon. You've got all these great runners. Just stick with them for a while and take off at 20 miles in the traditional strength runner mode but joan ran from her own spirit and what her own body told her and uh damn if she didn't prove me and everyone else in the world wrong that day because she just held it and built a big lead and finished strongly and of course it was the first women's olympic marathon so it was incredibly emotional and uh I was trying to be an independent, uh, uh, non-favorite-leaning journalist, even though I was runner's world. But, uh, you know, half the people around me were crying in the stands when she came into the the stadium because it was so emotional to see uh, an American woman runner in Los Angeles win the first Olympic women's marathon in such commanding style. You've ran Boston, I think, 25 times at least, maybe more. If you would, Ambie, can you talk about 2013? You were three quarters of a mile from the finish when the terrorist attack occurred. Did you know what was happening when they stopped the race? Yeah, that's what's so startling to me to this day. Uh, 2013, I'll backtrack just a little. Um, was the 45th anniversary of my win in 1968. If you do 68 and 13 quickly in your head, you'll get 45. That made me the oldest returning champion who was still running Boston. So I kind of thought I was the big kid on campus and, you know, everybody should be paying attention to me and bowing to my longevity in the sport and blah, 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 blah. And um, so here I am getting down to a mile to the finish line. And, you know, when you've got a mile to go, you know, you're going to make it. So you're kind of celebrating uh, already. And suddenly I see something I've never seen before in my life. And that is the entire field has stopped in front of me and there's no place to go and no one's moving. And we had absolutely no idea what had happened at the finish line. Even though we were only a mile away, we had heard nothing, no sound traveled. We had seen nothing. We had no reports of why we were stopped, why somebody was preventing us from finishing the Boston Marathon. We were all incredibly pissed off. And I was probably one of the most angry briefly uh, because I thought it was a big day for me and I wanted to knock out that finish on the 45th anniversary of my victory. And so when I finally realized that there was nothing to do but walk back to our hotel, which the word had filtered back to us, that's what we should do. And as we walked, we saw this endless stream of police cars and ambulances and chaos and somebody called or somehow I learned what had happened. And when you realize that, when you realize that people have died at the finish line, when you realize the chaos, when you realize the fear, when you realize literally that terrorism has rocked the streets of Boston on this particular day, uh, you feel very embarrassed and small about your own thoughts of 
glamour and success uh, that you had been harboring just a few uh, minutes beforehand. But uh, it was an incredibly sad, frightening, and emotional day at Boston. Uh, we all wondered for a few days if it was the end of marathoning in the U.S. and around the world, perhaps, because marathons obviously cannot be policed for 26 miles, and runners are in danger <laughs> if someone wants to get us on the course, and spectators are cannot be secured Uh cheering for us on the course. Uh, we wondered if this was the end, and then suddenly we all rose up in a unified voice of uh, resilience, uh, uh, wanting to come back to Boston the next year, and we turned all our energies towards 2014 and, and bringing Boston uh, and our, our love for the people of Boston and the Boston Marathon back onto the streets in 2014. So... We went from unbelievable tragedy to uh, an unbelievable celebration 365 days later. 2018 was your 50th anniversary of your win. Also, got to be one of the worst weather conditions I've ever seen on the Boston Marathon. How was that for you, Ambie, in, in that situation? <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely the worst weather ever at Boston. There's no question about that. <laughs> once, once again, I had pictured myself glamorously uh, crossing the finish line at Boston with uh, uh, sun shining and thousands applauding me and uh, movie cameras rolling and all that <laughs> crap. And uh, the weather was horrendous. Uh, I fortunately had five or six friends running with me that day. I gathered them all together at the start and I said, listen, we're not running for time. We're not running for glory. We're not running for anything but survival today. We've got to all stick together. We've got to all take care of each other and we've all got to go for uh, a moderate finish just to get to the finish. And fortunately, um, although we were miserable, my brother came very close to dropping out with uh, hypothermia. The rest of us were cold and damp and unhappy much of the time out there. We did stick together. We did take care of each other. We did all finish together in a pitifully slow time. Uh, but it was nonetheless my 50th anniversary, and I got there. So uh, it counts, and uh, it was uh, thrilling to, to close out the 50 years. You have a bunch of books, and for my listeners, go to the show notes. I'm going to put a link where you can order books of Ambies. Uh, you can go to ambieburfoot.com. You can get an autographed copy. He's got several books on there. The one I want to talk to you about, Ambie, is the one he did in 2019, Run Spirations. If you would talk about that book, please. Uh, that's in interesting that you asked me about that. I would not have uh, thought about that that uh, initially that book came about because a friend of mine and I on our runs started talking about nothing but motivation and we decided that motivation is the name of the game and uh, because it's what we need she's an aged aged runner as I am almost as old as I am and uh, we wanted to try to share the motivation that we still felt with other people who we knew were feeling a gap of uh, motivation in their running lives. It's not easy to, to share motivation. We all tend to believe, and I do believe this, that motivation has to come from within, and each and every one of us is responsible for creating the uh, themes and motifs and beliefs and visions and, and life principles that give us motivation to stay fit and keep running. But we thought, okay, we're going to do a book and we're going to divide it into three parts that are motivational in three different ways. And one part was motivational profiles of everyone from Meb Kefleski and uh, Catherine Switzer and Bobby Gibb and all those people who have inspired all of us to some lesser known runners who nonetheless have encountered major obstacles uh, in their lives. Um, we also wrote a section which we thought were uh, was guiding wisdom uh, principles uh, that if you follow them and if you stick to them can help you maintain 
healthy running, which can help you with the motivation that you need. And finally, we did the last third of the book, just the 50 or 60 best motivational running quotes we could possibly find. And of course, those came from Shakespeare and the Bible and the great philosophers and George Sheehan and any number of different sources. But uh, we tried to combine the three, the motivational profiles, the, uh, the wisdom for the ages and the quotes for the ages in the hope that people could edit on any day, just pick up the book open it to a page, find something in 60 seconds that would give them a little bit of a jolt to help them get out the door the, that day. I know this is probably difficult as books are kind of like your, your pets and your children and stuff like that, but what's your favorite book that you've written? I suppose my favorite book is The, the First Ladies of Running, which is about the pioneers of women's distance running. And... Uh, I'm trying to remember how the book came about. But anyway, I was fortunate a lot, enough in my running career that the start of my career in the mid-60s was essentially the start of running careers for Roberta Gibb and Catherine Switzer and Nina Kusick and Jacqueline Hansen and Joan Benoit and Patty Catalano, and the list goes on and on. And I remember those days very warmly. It wasn't like we mixed a lot with the women back then, but we all totally supported them. We all thought it was great to have women running the races. And um, looking back, it started to seem to me that while Joni and Catherine and a few others were well-known, there were probably another 20 or so who were not as well known as the superstars, but were equally as deserving as being considered part of this first important cohort that got us all to the 84 Olympic marathon. So I wrote about everybody. Uh, and some of them would be, uh, you know, Marilyn Bevins, the, the first great African-American uh, distance runner and uh, Shalane Flanagan's mother, uh, Cheryl, uh, who was a world record holder in the early 70s. And then uh, the afterthought or the last chapter was about the fact that I actually ran the marathon when Oprah Winfrey ran her marathon in 1994. And uh, while she was not in the pioneer group and certainly not nearly as fast as they were she had a huge impact on the women's running landscape because she's Oprah Winfrey and there's only one of her. And to this day, uh, I believe she would count as the most famous person on the planet ever to complete a marathon. So she sort of wrapped up uh, the whole package. And, and this was a book that took, a, even though I knew them all, of course, it took a lot of research. It took a lot of tracking some of them down. It took phone interviews, took their cooperation. And one of the nicest things that's happened since the book was published, I think, five years ago, is that it kind of reunited all of those original pioneer women with each other. And they now do Zoom calls together mm. and have pajama parties at the Boston Marathon and things like that. So um, I think um, they're important because they forever will be the pioneers of women's distance running. They did it against odds that women and pressures that women today can't possibly understand. And every woman runner today stands on their shoulders. For a listener who may be a non-runner that's now inspired by what you've been talking about today and goes, I'm going to give running a try, what kind of tips can you give to them? Um, giving running a try is, is a tremendous thing, and I hope a few listeners will. The, the key to running is to realize that you have to go incredibly slowly and incredibly gradually at first. In fact, most people getting out of the chair and going out the front door can't run much more than 30 seconds, if that, uh, unless they're young and fit. And that's perfectly okay. All, all beginning running programs begin by having someone run for 30 seconds and then walk for a minute or two minutes or five minutes or whatever it takes. And so what you do is you run a little, 
and you walk more. And then a week later, you run a little bit more and you walk a little bit less. And and you do this three or four times a, a week for 20 or 30 minutes at a time, if you can. And you gradually shift up on the running and shift down on the walking. But always remembering to run slowly. People universally run too fast because they want to look fast. Who doesn't? And when you run too fast, you get out of breath and you get discouraged and you quit. So you just shuffle along with a smile on your face and are happy for the running you're doing. And when you finally get to the point that maybe you can run, walk a couple of miles, then you you reevaluate and you decide if you want to run a 5K or train for a half marathon or something. But start slow, stay slow, keep it gradual, keep it consistent. That's how I got hooked, exactly as you just described it. Ambi has some training plans, runwithambi.com. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes. Last question, Ambi, is when the words Boston Marathon are spoken, what comes to mind? Uh, for, for me, Boston Marathon is the uh, essence of the spa, sport. It's the original one. Uh, I, I, I'm a historian. I love tradition. I love the history of the Boston Marathon. I love Clarence DeMar, who won it seven times in the old days, and the old blue-collar runners, and the Indian winners, Tarzan Brown, uh, uh, the Kellys. So many people have run Boston. It's been essentially the same race for so long. We've all had to stagger up Heartbreak Hill. We've all collapsed at the finish line. Um, The fact that it now has qualifying standards and is very hard to get into makes it perhaps a, a little bit more vaunted. I actually wish that more people had the opportunity to run Boston at whatever pace. But um, the stewards of the Boston Marathon have done a great job keeping it true to its most important traditions. And uh, this year, the Boston Marathon will be in October for presumably the only time in my life. And because of that, I've decided I'm going to run it again. (laughs) So uh, I'm going to get out there and run the Boston Marathon in October because it will be a new, exciting, different adventure for me to challenge myself with. Amby, you've been in several Hall of Fames. You're a Hall of Famer in my book. I want to say thank you for your time and coming on Before the Lights and just talking about a brief section and moment in your life. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Tommy, thank you so much. It was a pleasure for me. I appreciate all the homework and research you did for this interview. And I hope uh, your listeners learned a few things also. I'm sure they will. Listeners, if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, please reach out to me before the lights pod at gmail.com. Please follow me on Instagram as well at before the lights podcast. Thank you for listening to before the lights. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, a salute, a chin chin. <laughs>